I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome to the Playing FTSE podcast. My name's Paul and each episode, me and the lads get together to talk about the stocks, stock market news and finance in general. Quick disclaimer, you shouldn't consider anything in this podcast as personal financial advice. If you need such advice, go to a financial advisor. And please remember when investing in any form, your capital is at risk. So sit back, relax, and let the lads fill you in with all the stock market news of the week. The sucker's going up. This week, we've got data downloads and CEOs in trouble. It's the Playing FTSE podcast. I'm here with Steve D and Steve W. What have we got going on this week, guys? And how has your week been? My week's been pretty good, Paul, actually. Um, I've managed to read a book for the first time in kind of ages. So my line of work involves quite a lot of reading, which means that in my downtime, I don't have that much of it for reading. And it feels like the kind of brain space that I use for uh, reading is is pretty much used by the time I get home from work. But this week I have actually managed to read a book. I've read a book about investing. Um, it's by a guy who... Uh, Paul, you might be 50-50 whether you've heard of this one in my head. Steve, I would say 80% you haven't, but it's a possibility, can't rule it out. Uh, it's by a guy called Steve Anthony. Um, either of you heard of him? Nope. Don't think so. Nope. Okay. Um, so the book is called, uh, I'm holding it up to the camera just at the moment, Paul and Steve can't see this, but uh, it's called, Oh, wait, Mr. Panda. Uh, it's a book for, uh, well, very, very small children. Um, I've been reading it to my son this week. He's enjoying it very much. But it has here a kind of assortment of animals. There's a sort of llama type thing there. Uh, and a um, what appears to be a kind of anteater thing. And they're all waiting while this panda is baking something. Uh, and they all refuse to wait, basically. And there's this tiny penguin that's there the whole time who just says, I'll wait, Mr. Panda, for the entirety of the book, basically. Uh, but then the, panda, the penguin waits and waits and waits and waits, and he doesn't get bored, and he doesn't go away, and he keeps on waiting, and he gets this massive socking donut at the end, which is uh, about, I would say, approximately 18 times the size of his entire being. And he gets the entire donut to himself, and appears to be kind of squashed by it on the final page. But it's a good metaphor for investing and the importance of patience and not getting bored and running away and not selling. And I'm using this to teach my son about investing from the <laughs> age of roughly five and a half months or so. Uh, it is the main investing book that I have read uh, this week <laughs> or indeed ever. Um, but aside from that, my portfolio has mainly gone down. Steve, how has your week been? Uh, my portfolio is, is also down. Uh, I've been reading a book which doesn't sound nearly as interesting as that. I've been reading <laughs> the uh, emotionally, emotionally, the Emotional Intelligent Investor by Ravi Mehta. I think the Motley Fool guys talk about it an awful lot, and I think I've heard him on the Motley Fool a couple of times. But God, is it a drab book? It's awful. And I've got to the point now where he's trying to convince me that technical analysis is, is a thing. And like in my head, all I can hear is like Mystic Meg trying to like sell me like a premium rate hotline. <laughs> And I just, I just cannot get on with it at all. But last night I had a bit of good news. It's, it's Wednesday, um, uh, as we record this. MongoDB put out some really, really mm. good earnings. So they've kind of saved my, uh, my high risk crap portfolio today. Uh, it saved it insofar as it's only down 0.08%. How about you, Paul? Um, I'm currently reading Our Wait Mr. Panda on YouTube right now. <laughs> so uh you can probably come back to me no i've and i've just seen the size of that freaking donut uh and it is pretty big and um yeah it looks like that penguin gets pretty crushed at the end of there. um this week uh in stocks um yeah, yeah i've been getting hit pretty hard to be honest with you i think everybody is at the moment and uh if i'm honest i'm loving it because i've still got a lot of money to go back in the market and i want these prices to be lower so i am kind of loving it at the moment um because it feels i feel i start to feel a little bit more vindicated that all the stocks that i sold might actually come back back down to a reasonable price pretty soon um i like the idea of this investing book i've been trying to draw up ideas for child investing books for a while i've got this kind of idea of like having one with two squirrels that are fighting over uh, hiding nuts or something like that and i can't really put it together in an investment way just yet but um yeah that that is a really good investment book i'm gonna buy that investment book i'll wait mr panda it's called um as far as books go um this week, uh, I, I haven't been reading a book because I basically can't read, but um, I have been listening to Daniel Pink's uh, Power of Regret, 
again this week, which has been very interesting. It's a very interesting book about the regrets of the human psyche, basically, and, and what people say on their deathbed, you know, things that it, it's very interesting one to me because it, they're very similar to things that I've heard on people's deathbeds as well, which is, you know, nice. Keep it light. Briscoe is it's, it's a, it's a fun podcast, but, um, uh, it's, it's a very interesting book. Um, and as far as investing goes, it, it does give you the idea or the sense that you, you need to kind of act now on some of your greatest needs and your greatest goals, like investing for the long term, not interrupting compounding. And of course, um, investing in yourself as well, which is a big thing and taking the chances on some of the things out there. Um, other than that, I've been getting on pretty well this week. The sun is shining. It's really hot. And I've unfortunately got to come home for a week over Christmas to see my freaking family. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, uh, yeah, that I'm, I'm not looking forward to coming back to you guys in the cold. I'm, I'm really not. Just on Dan Pink, um, he's got a really good book out called Drive. I don't know if you've ever read yeah, that. It's a, a very interesting book. Yeah, it's a really interesting book on like what kind of motivates people. And people tend to think that uh, some one thing motivates you. And by the end of the book, you probably think there's a there's a little bit more really that would that would motivate you. But yeah, re- really interesting book on on the study of on the study of motivation. I think I think you'll like uh, Power of Regret. It gives you it's. It, it does touch on motivation a lot, but it also touches on the things that it puts a lot of life into to perspective, basically. Hmm. Anyway, this week, what do we want to talk about first? We're looking at the big data dump that Steve W and Steve D have been looking at. Who wants to lead on that one? I'm going to start. It's Steve D sent me a link to a tweet this week, which was from a guy called Sean Emery, who is at the Inside Scoop podcast. Steve D recommends that quite highly. And it had lots of interesting stats about what people have been downloading in terms of, I think mostly in terms of app downloads, not video downloads or anything like that particularly. But there's quite a few here that are on the list that um, jump out for sort of various different reasons, I guess. One that caught my eye uh, that I'll sort of start us off with and Steve can pick up his favourite in a moment was uh, Instagram, I think last month, managing 7 million more downloads than TikTok, which is, I guess, kind of interesting for those of us who own meta platforms and are interested in the strength or otherwise of that family of apps division and working out exactly how it might be faring in terms of competition from, from TikTok, most notably. Or in terms of people just leaving the platforms and it getting a bit old and a bit stale and a bit um, upper generation, basically. So this, um, one of the two things that kind of came out was there were 62 million downloads for Instagram in November, which is their second highest month, I think, ever, it was saying. The highest was the previous one in October. Versus 54 million for TikTok, which has been coming down for four four, uh, months in a row from what I saw of it. So momentum going the way of meta at the moment, TikTok waning in popularity. I don't have TikTok. I've never actually been on TikTok either as a viewer or as a creator, if that's what they're called. But um, positive news for meta, I suppose. Always nice to hear if you're someone like me. Yeah, and uh, it was in, uh, interesting to note that their uh, downloads are now at two times what their 2019 monthly levels was, were as well. So uh, perhaps a reversing trend, really, at Instagram. Um, I mean, we've all thought that, you know, that was a very, very saturated market. The, the family of apps were very well saturated. Um, and it turns out that that might not be the case. I mean, some of those are probably attributed to, um, obviously, people getting new phones and things like that. But I can't imagine all of them are. So I think that's uh, really, really positive news for, for Instagram. The, the one that caught my eye, though, was it's a stock that's in my crap stocks portfolio. It's gone, I've changed it back to uh, calling it the capital incinerator portfolio. <laughs> um, and that was um, Duolingo, which has topped the education um, um, sector for, well, the chart for um, this month again. It was its third best month ever. Uh, even its other two apps have had 150,000 downloads. Uh, Duolingo is a, a fast growing company. Um, looks a very interesting company to me. Um, very tempted to add it into my uh, main portfolio as well, but I, I've just 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 hung off 
for now. Um, I just don't think that kind of company is in there. We're in that kind of environment where we like the, you know, the kind of duolingos who are still burning cash, not really turning a profit, but, um, an interesting company in an interesting sector. I've had a go. I'm currently learning Italian mm. uh, just to see what it was like. Um, and I must admit, I, um, apart from the threatening emails you get, you get like a threatening email and you get a threatening notification if you miss a day. Um, so you're never gonna learn. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. But but I'm trying. Do you know what I mean? But <laughs> you just can't can't be asked to do it every day. But uh, yeah, I am seeing the benefits, and I've learned quite a quite a bit to be honest. I think I think Duolingo is good up to a point. Now I've learned um, a good amount of Norwegian uh, through Duolingo, but uh, basically what I eventually got to right, it was really good at teaching sentence structure. But when it got to uh nouns basically uh which is the most important part of uh learning a language unless you're like gifted like that guy who goes around speaking chinese to chinese people you must have seen him on on the internet somewhere mm. um unless you're gifted like him you have to be immersed in the culture that you're uh learning the language of because you're not going to learn nouns and simple uh communication methods outside and and Duolingo is great for like I say teaching teaching sentence structure about new languages I'm currently learning Greek on Duolingo actually and now you think about it I I don't know why I've never looked into it as an investment considering how much I've used it in the past but I do feel that Mm. my use of Duolingo has been very fleeting as in I only come to it when I feel like I need to start learning a certain language and um uh, in between that it doesn't even get a look in but and 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 to be honest with you like you say you talk about the threatening emails that you get on duolingo uh to bring you back into it i don't think they work they don't work as a nudge in the same way that uh being gifted loads of coins to improve your farm or whatever on on facebook uh, uh, gets you in it's a shame. It's a shame it doesn't work in the same way because uh, that would actually be a really good way to learn language. <laughs> they are trying that, though, aren't they? they there are. is like an in-app currency now which you can spend to yeah. get like keep your streaks up, and they've added leaderboards. And I think they're really trying. They're really trying hard to stop by gamify, turn it into a yeah, yeah. try turn it into a game. And it feels a bit. I mean, you must admit when you get one of those two times experience boosts and you see yourself jumping up the table, you're like, <laughs> somebody's heading to the top tonight. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I'm going to do. 15 Italian lessons just, just you see Paolo B <laughs> I, mean, I don't know I mean I, 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 I must admit I am enjoying using it and I, I mean my wife walked by the other day and she was just sat there and I was just sort of like building a sentence up in, in Italian. She sort of like watched me po- like poking it in and then obviously getting 100% on the lesson she was like you don't realise like just a couple of weeks ago, you couldn't speak a word of Italian, and now you're now you're like ordering a cappuccino <laughs> with sugar in a, in a cafe and giving directions to the waiter to the nearest store and things like that. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, there is, <laughs> I appear to have learned something. Yeah, there is huh. there is something in in that whole um, rinse and repeat method that they've got, which is really really good. That gets it. I wonder. Mm. Here we go. Oh god, this is going to be horrible because Twitter's been full of uh, open ai this week hasn't it um the uh, ai chatbot i wonder if you could get make a good ai chatbot in a different language to help you learn a language much quicker is is it called chat cpt or something that's come out at the moment there yeah chat gpt i have a point to come back to here for you actually in a second but carry on Cool. A couple of quick thoughts then in that case. Um, firstly, I didn't realise you guys spoke so many languages and learned them all through Duolingo. This is news to me. I tried using Duolingo a couple of years ago and I found it pretty poor. The main reason I found it fairly poor was because I was trying to sort of brush back up and maybe expand a bit on my French that I'd done back at school sort of several moons ago. Um, and one of the things I thought it had me doing was giving me some French words and then a bunch of English words underneath to try and build the sentence out of. And there were a couple of problems with this. One was that 
there weren't really enough words to make it much of a challenge, so it was mostly just arranging the ones that I had in front of me into a sentence shape. And the other problem was that one of them had a capital letter, so that one obviously went at the beginning. <laughs> um, and so once you got the first word in place, the rest of it just sort of follows, and I had no idea what I was translating. I was doing quite well at my wife's German one, actually, and I don't speak any German at all. <laughs> I was getting German stuff right just by kind of working it out from the English. Yeah. So I was a little bit wary of Duolingo back then. Yeah. It definitely gets progressively harder. Sometimes it'll throw you... Now, I think there's a lot of different ways now. Sometimes it throws you in the middle of a, a conversation and you hear some mm -hmm. conversation in Italian and then it'll say, what, you know, what, what did she ask Marco or something like that? And you have to try and pick out the, the, the area that, cool. you know, the thing that you heard, which is, which is a lot better than, um, than I can imagine what you probably dealt with. But I've noticed it's getting progressively harder as well. So mm. perhaps you just got stuck in the baby steps kind of thing. You now even like, if you, if you're hundred percent a couple of lessons in a row, it says, don't even bother with this one. You're an expert. <laughs> Get yourself onto the next level. And then it, it, it like does. boots up and you're like, I don't know any of those words. It, I'm in serious trouble. Yeah, it does. Um, I think Steve, what you've been caught in there is some vague form of Pavlovian conditioning that it's trying to, uh, put you through and it's it's constant it's constant rinse and repeat rinse and repeat until you eventually uh it, th these words start going in and yeah mm. there is a there, there is that in the baby steps part of it that makes it very easy for you to complete some lessons but it's not what it's trying to do i don't think i don't think it's trying to get you to complete these lessons that makes you think or uh, or it, it doesn't think that you're learning the language by doing this, but what it's trying to do is put you in front of the sen the sentence structure and the words, and it's just getting you used to seeing the words constantly. Yeah, and, and giving you some early success as well, which yes, obviously motivates you, doesn't yeah, it? So. Yeah. That's, that's the other thing, is easy, easy low-hanging fruit success. But let's talk about uh, Instagram and TikTok, because that seems to be one of the main talking points between the two, is whether Instagram has is really being killed by the Chinese TikTok right now. Um, the answer, according to this download data, is no. I mean, my personal bias is hurrah, because everyone on the on FinTwit has been banging on about how TikTok is destroying Instagram, and the Instagram's dead in the water. It's no longer... Uh, and there's nothing ever coming out of Instagram anymore. But what we're seeing there is uh, positive data downloads um, on Instagram. I, I'd love to see a bit more detail on the ages of the people that are downloading Instagram over TikTok uh, right now. That would be very interesting to see. I don't know whether it's a flood back to Instagram because it's become more interesting. But my God, I will tell you, as somebody who has TikTok and ends up in TikTok holes every day, every now and then, and has Instagram and ends up in Instagram real holes, holes every now and then, I am way more impressed with Instagram and what it delivers me rather than TikTok. TikTok seems to just deliver me a bag of absolute crap, just really uninteresting, mindless, absolute crap of girls dancing and all sorts of shit. Yeah. TikTok's Sounds terrible. A, TikTok's a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, yeah. like, I've, I've watched a few, like, I've, I've had a good scroll through it when, you know, when I'm uploading stuff for the the playing footsie highlights and you, you can end up in a in a in a trap of just being sat there like flicking up every so often yeah. to to whatever's going on but the, i mean there's a dude in there who like throws stuff at the camera and cooks in a pan i think he's called daniel mccoy or something like that and you basically watch one of his videos and it just circulates the whole lot mm -hmm. through you and then there's like the the dude who dances dressed as spider-man and you're going to see every that. one of his videos over the next like <laughs> two or three and you just think to yourself like oh, you know i was interested in this once you know i watched one of them but yeah. that doesn't mean i need to see 30 yeah so I, I don't know about instagram reels instagram reels i tend to find they all still seem to have all the tiktok branding on them so it's like where well, instagram reels is where like the more mature audience goes to get its tiktok <laughs> yeah a little um, bit a little bit definitely and you what i find um you know the difference between instagram and um tiktok I, and i think you touched on it there is that TikTok tries to show you more stuff. Like it tries to push you, push you out there and find you different things. But in doing that, it really sends you a lot of crap, like really mm. mindless, horrible stuff of just, I don't know, just some 
underage girl just sitting standing there dancing whereas on instagram it's a little bit more um there is a little bit more intellect to it and you know this whole theory about how tiktok is uh, run by the chinese and the the chinese are trying to dumb us down by sending us absolute crap and uh, just have people like and look at things that are that are essentially creating our idiocracy um if you compare instagram reels and tiktok at the moment yeah you can you can see a big difference you can see how dumb tiktok is in comparison to instagram that's not to say that instagram is particularly good i mean none of it is great it's all designed to keep you scrolling keep your eyes on that screen for as long as possible instagram does some very weird things at the moment and if you're ready for an insight into my psyche right now um because because i've been so, i've been so uh shocked by it if you go into my explore tab on instagram so i am a wedding photographer so i look look at lots of wedding stuff so on the explore tab loads and loads of wedding stuff it's really really quite quite cool and i've i've also managed to detail this and change this myself which has been quite interesting which shows how simple the instagram low um algorithm is at the moment um so i see lots of snowboarding i see lots of wedding photography i see very little about fi personal finance actually which really annoys me because i want to see more i want to see more of what uh, the instagram creators are creating about uh, personal finance i also don't see a lot about personal finance on tiktok either i have no idea how to get myself being that person who wants to see personal finance stuff on, on instagram it doesn't work and um finally something that happened to me very recently is i noticed literally thousands of photographs and uh instagram reels of avril lavigne <laughs> like for some reason <laughs> instagram seems to think i really like avril lavigne and i have no idea why you are <laughs> you was telling us how lonely you were Paul, just before we came on air <laughs> yeah, yeah, i'll go that isn't it <laughs> okay okay so what i can tell you one more one thing uh differently is that what i did one day is i had a ridiculous amount of photographs of Avril Lavigne being shown to me. So what I did is I went to the uh, spyglass and I typed in Scarlett Johansson. So I just typed in a, basically a different female and changed. It went from Avril Lavigne to Scarlett Johansson like immediately. It was just constant bombardment of um, Scarlett Johansson. And I was kind of like, well, this is what Instagram thinks of me. <laughs> like, I, just, I literally like just looking at this one woman who i've typed in about five minutes ago and a really simple algorithm but uh, i i don't know it must be it must work because these people uh, you know this is the way they're doing it at the moment when you um when you eventually go home paul your wife's gonna catch your instagram and think you're a pervert who wants to get married <laughs> i tell you what i tell you what the, the the really crazy thing is um is so on tiktok i get a lot of andrew tate like ridiculous amounts of andrew tate because mm. uh you know i obviously have as a as a male i obviously have some affinity to some of the things that he says but aversion to the to some of the other things that he says on instagram i can't get it i basically can't if, if I type in Andrew Tate, I can't, I can see, base, if I search for it right there and then, I can get lots of Andrew Tate um, videos and things. But if I come away from it, it does not show me it. It's so strange um, that it doesn't recommend, even though I've searched for it a lot of times, it doesn't recommend me certain types of videos, which is so weird uh, to think. It's, it's just interesting to see how the algorithm works at the moment. I have friends, particularly for my wedding photography business, who keep saying to me, you need to post on your wedding photography Instagram uh, page loads and loads. You need to be doing reels. You need to be doing stories. You need to be showing people your life all day. And that will convert into uh, clients and more and more photo wedding photography jobs. And I was kind of like, yeah, all right, I just can't really be asked. But these people are using this as a business. This is their main mm. business driver. They barely even have a website. It's it's all driven through Instagram. It's their main business mm. driver. Facebook's gone. Facebook is out of here. It's been long gone a, a long time. And I would agree with that as well. In fact, a lot of them on Facebook say they get very poor quality clients. But on Instagram and not on TikTok, no one is getting anything on TikTok. No one is generating ben business 
in the wedding industry world, at least that I know of, uh, from TikTok, everything is Instagram, Instagram, mm. Instagram for them. And, um, that's, that's been a very telling sign for me as to who is the positive business. Is. <laughs> so conscious we've probably overran how much we want to talk about the segment, but Steve, was there anything else in that, um, in the thread that sort of caught your eye? So I own, I'll just stick to Insta and Meta just for a moment then. So I was trying to work out what I should make of this download data because Meta platforms releases its user data daily and monthly for both Facebook and the family of apps pretty much every quarter along with its earnings. And all of those were up in the last quarter between 2% and 4% on each of them. So that a lot of people are downloading it. I wasn't sure quite what that tells me over and above the user data that we get anyway. I think perhaps what it tells me, and I do think there is something when I thought about it a little bit longer, is that one of the things I wonder about sometimes with the family of apps across the board is how many fake accounts there are and that sort of thing. I don't know that I think there's many kind of fake downloads going on. So maybe the idea that there's encouraging download numbers is helpful because it indicates that there is sort of genuine growth rather than just, I guess, what you might call paper growth from fake accounts or bots or whatever. Um, but that kind of caught my eye a little bit. There were some mm. other things. Um, Zoom out downloading Teams every month since 2020. Mm. That didn't surprise me at all. Uh, Zoom strikes me as more of an upstart. Microsoft via Teams is much more of an established thing. Teams is much more business-sided. I don't know if I'm missing something there, but that didn't surprise me in the slightest, the idea that Zoom was attracting more downloads than Teams was. Is it still growing no, and- on its downloads, Zoom? Just out of interest. Uh, I'm not sure. I wrote down the number relative to Teams here, and I okay. dropped that it's been downloaded more than Teams every month since 2020. But uh, I'm I'm not sure whether it's been uh, you, still growing. You would assume that though. Teams is literally pointed itself at businesses, hasn't it? And Zoom mm-hmm. is retail and business, so they've just got a larger market that they're they're going after. There, um, one of the ones that jumped out at me was Spotify again, having a, another very good month. Added an extra 27 million in downloads. It was its second ever, uh, second best month ever, and the Download trend since June, um, Sean says, have been up and to the right, which, you know, that bodes well for um, for the next earnings report because obviously Spotify has an ad supported tier at the very worst, doesn't it? So even if these are free years, that's a little bit of incremental revenue onto the uh, <clears throat> onto their books. Makes you wonder. Nothing personal about Sean at all for what it's worth, but uh, up and to the right annoys me. Uh, to the right, everything goes to the damn right. It goes it's just that's just what existing means uh, that it goes to the right. It, it goes up to the right, down to the right, or flat to the right. But yeah, uh, sorry, Paul. That, that's ex- that's existential. That is that's uh, your your life is just going to the right constantly. Um, <laughs> what what I was going to suggest to you is. Um, big tech laying off all the time, putting in lots of recessionary type measures, lots of, you know, doom and gloom news that comes out about um, big tech at the moment, and particularly in, you know, this social media downloadable big tech and um, everything looking hunkery-dory. Are they lying to us that this big recession is coming or are they just kind of trying to streamline a bit? So I saw Andy Jassy talk a little bit about this at the uh, the New York Times, uh, whatever it was, chat festival thing. And he said that basically when – this is what you should come to expect. When times are good and money is flowing free and there, you know, there, there's no tightness on debt, on credit and anything like that, the, the thing these companies are going to do is basically try everything they can do to grow and they're going to put money into bets – that um, don't necessarily work out. And that might be products that are successful, but new lines that they want to add to this product. So, for instance, um, you know, there's been the big thing about um, Alexa. Um, they've been saying that they've been cutting staff uh, at Alexa. They think it's a big loss loser. Uh, sorry, big loser for them, big loss leader. And uh, they think they're going to get rid of it. That's not what Jassy was saying. Jassy was saying that we actually had teams that were working on brand new things for Alexa. But then when we actually sat and thought about them and thought, look, you know, we're in a tighter capital allocation kind of market, you know, we're being punished every time we make a loss. Is this particular add-on to Alexa the thing that we want to do right now? And if the answer to that was no, then they cut the team. So that's where their cuts are coming from. And I think that tends to be where the cuts are, at least the freezes are coming from across the board, is that the other bets, the big, the things that we're tagging on or, or the other bets that we're tagging on to other bets are the things that these big tech companies are um, sort of like, drawing back on i guess um things like google you see 
through the last recession, through the 2008, they increased their headcount exponentially. Um, they have now have an activist investor that doesn't want them to increase their headcount exponentially, but Google seems to be doing it. They've said that they're going to have a freeze, but the freeze has come a little bit late. Their headcount is up absolutely massive at the moment. So, uh, you know, that freeze might just be coming just because they've hired so many previous to the freeze. They like taking time off the market, don't they, as well? And uh, but is so is that you know a case of they've kind of just grown? That's quite harsh to say too quickly. I just, I really want a better word than that. But they've they've sort of grown. Let's let's take Alexa for example. So they've grown the Alexa and they've got their core team around Alexa, and then they've got five offshoots which are simple systems that they think could come in. Like one day Alexa might. I don't know, run around and squirt water up your ass or something like that. And they've decided, uh, well, we did kind of think that might be a good idea, but that's a silly idea. So we're going to take that one away now. And all you people are fired on the water up the ass thing. But the thing that makes you the brandy in the chair, that's, that's one of the things we will probably stick around on. Um, is it, is it that as in they've just kind of grown too far? Or is it now that they're coming, uh, now that things don't look as good, they are throwing less sticky shit at the wall? Is, is it, if well, you that, get what I mean? That, uh, it's responsible growth versus irresponsible growth, isn't yeah. it? That's the thing. They're trying to give you the impression that, hey, look, we're not going to try absolutely everything now. We understand that you, you think that's a bad thing to do. So mm. we're going to go and try just the things that, just the best ideas. We're going to focus on just our best ideas rather than, you know, having our second and third rate ideas. And, you know, we've got this this money and money's free at the moment. So we may as well try them all. And this, this huge pool of talent for us to get the engineers in and actually get this thing to happen uh, rather than doing all of that. They're just going to focus on, you know, their best ideas, which I don't think it's a bad thing at all. No. And it's a, it's certainly a good positive spin. If I was being cynical, it's a positive spin on the idea that growth is not flowing, right? Is to say, we're not growing less. We're just kind of being a bit more careful with your money rather than before when we had your money and your investment and uh, we were just uh, partying with it. We were seeing, we were seeing just what we could get Alexa to do. And uh, now maybe we'll take it a bit more seriously, which isn't a good sign necessarily. You know, if I wanted to frame it badly, I could certainly frame it badly, couldn't I? And, and I'm not aiming to here, but yeah, very interesting way they're well, sort of looking at just it. Jassy did touch upon that because he did say, look, eventually, originally they were just a box seller and then they tagged on other bits like electronics and then they tagged on the whole marketplace and then they tagged on marketing and then they tagged on AWS and then they tagged on Prime and things like that and they tagged on delivery and, and logistics and warehousing. And all of these things were of, at one point an, another bet that mm -hmm. they focused on, they dedicated time to, they put money onto. So he's saying that, what they're focusing on now is their best ideas. These are the ideas that eventually become pillars of Amazon or pillars of Prime or an add-on to Prime or something that helps reduce customer churn. And and that's all they're, all they're doing. All the other ideas that they've now decided that are either too expensive, not worth doing, not getting the traction, second-rate ideas, they're getting cut. They're just going to focus on the best stuff. Yeah, I wonder if Netflix is going to take no note of that. Something that we're we'll, sure we'll hear about later in uh, towards the end of the podcast. But right now we're going to move on then to uh, CEOs that are in trouble. Uh, the main CEO, Larry Fink, has been called into question by some of the, the investors. Uh, perhaps you can shed a bit more light on that story. Uh, yeah, happy to do so. So, um Larry Fink has been, uh, basically, he's uh, been criticised uh, by an activist investor. The activist investor is Bluebell Capital Partners. Um, they've taken a, a, a reasonably small stake in in BlackRock, to be to be fair, and they have uh, basically asked Larry Fink to uh, resign or to to be fired. Uh, they think his uh, essentially his approach uh, is inconsistent with um his focus on ESG and things like that essentially they they think they think Larry think is not woke enough which uh <laughs> is is kind of strange because you I mean you have the Republican party on one side saying Larry think is the most woke man on the planet and you have like the democratic side who say Larry think is not doing enough for ESG and Bluebell are obviously firmly sitting on this uh 
on this left wing side. But Steve, do you have any information on Blue Bell? Are there something you've looked at before? Uh, I know a little bit about them. They're, uh, I think, an ESG enthusiast bunch. So BlackRock talk a good ESG game, I guess is the accusation here, and don't really act a good ESG game. It's a big thing of their kind of ETFs that they uh, push their ESG credentials. They're kind of big ESG pioneers. We've historically expressed not to do with BlackRock specifically, but scepticism about some of the ESG movement uh, or initiative, I guess, in general. And there's an idea, I think, from Bluebell that this is basically just a big load of nice marketing words for what it's worth. And as you point out, Steve, saying one thing and doing another is likely to annoy everybody on both sides of things, right? Because one pe- bunch of people are annoyed at what you say and the other bunch of people are annoyed at what you do. Um, Bluebell, I have written down, have a decent history of ousting CEOs, for what it's worth. Um, I have them written down as being involved in ousting a Danone CEO. I may have got that wrong, but I think they are kind of fairly enthusiastic and successful uh, activists a little bit when it comes to kind of moving people along here. Yeah, they've also tried Glaxo, Glencore and Vivendi mm. as well. Um, so they are they are very heavy on the uh, on, on the issue. So I, I, I've watched a couple of talks with Larry Fink that have happened since this um, since this has taken part, and and Fink is basically the brunt of uh, the brunt of the, the, the the case. Of the problem is, is that basically BlackRock is this huge asset manager. It it has a, almost a ten percent sway in almost every company you can think of, simply because its assets under management are so so heavy. Think has to try and vote in uh, in the best interests of his shareholders, and I think unfortunately, uh, well, unfortunately, depending on your view on the climate, I guess, uh, is still a fan of hydrocarbons. Uh, he thinks that we will be using them for another seventy years. He's more interested in rather than as just cutting off oil and gas straight away. He's more focused on as developing the science to carbon capture uh, and things like that because. He just doesn't think we'll be off um, hydrocarbons uh, anywhere near the rate that people seem to think we are. So that draws the ire of a, a lot of people. Um, they've called. There's been a number of, of um, the House representative parties who want think to come and explain why he has, you know, why he has so much power and why he feels like he should use it. So one of Fink's ideas is that he would start to divest the voting power down to mutual funds to beneficial owners and eventually he sees crypto and blockchain as a way that he will be able to fully tokenize the securities and actually send them all the way down to you know the retail investor to be able to vote to kind of wash his hands of the situation because i don't think anybody thinks think is necessarily a bad ceo i think a lot of people think that think is just not carrying out the wishes uh the wishes of uh, of the ownership um correctly which you know when you've got two sides of a political divide that's so far away from each other and can agree on nothing think seems to be in like a lose-lose situation what do they want what do they what do they want him to do obviously he's got his personal opinions right hydrocarbons whatever (laughs) it's it's stupid it's like it's like what do you okay so you've he's got personal views on hydrocarbons crypto to, to a point like he hates crypto but he sees it as the main way to democratize democratize everything which is um the whole point of crypto in the end uh which again looks to that if you really really wanted to but th- th- the point is is i'm sure everybody knows by now that esg is a marketing tool and barely anything more and he's got to sell to customers he's simply simply as simple as he needs to sell customers and get them to uh, buy into the fee structure and once he's got them there then he starts to make money and the way he's going to do that is by offering as many products as they can and advertising the products that are most popular at the moment if those are esg products then that's okay he's a seller and he's a moneymaker rather than, and he's able to put his own personal views behind behind him to, to do that. Um, unless, I guess, you have to be like Elon Musk and you have to, uh, whether it's true or not, who knows, um, you, you have to be seen to really believe in the outcome of your cause that you're really creating, changing free speech or you're um, electrifying the planet or, you know, whatever. Um, that's not how normal CEOs are done. I mean, what 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 has he got to do? He's got to be like Buffett and go around drinking Coke everywhere. I, I don't get it. 
Well, even Buffett wants to separate out his views from the views of his company, and I kind of respect anyone's right to do that. So Larry Fink can absolutely have views that are anti-ESG as a personal and private human, but he deploys BlackRock's voting rights in support of these kind of things. And I think the big problem that Bluebell has is that, okay, BlackRock advertises itself as a kind of ESG pioneer and then votes for a load of thermal coal initiatives um, at Glencore and so on, which... um, Yeah, you don't necessarily have to live everything out in your own life the way you kind of preach from your company. But equally, I would respect the right of an activist to call out um, what is misleading sales talk where they see it, I guess. It's a bit naughty, though, isn't it, as well? They're they're kind of saying, like, oh, assets under management at BlackRock have fallen by sort of like 15%. And you think... Well, yeah, because the market's, <laughs> market's gone 15%. down. You know what I mean? It's not, that's not, not Larry Fink's fault. I mean, like, if 15% of companies in a good year had pulled their funds out of BlackRock, you'd have been like, well, this is a problem, Larry. You're going to have to sort this. But in a in a market downturn where the S&P's fallen about 17%, if somebody said Fink's assets are down 15%, you say, oh, he's doing it. He's doing all right. <laughs> he's yeah, doing pretty well. Like, it's yeah, not so bad. The market's strange, down 30 It's it's a strange argument. It, I, I, anybody who seems to be in favour of ESG, who who isn't in favour of it just because it's a good start or it's an A start, uh, anybody who's actually in favour of it as an actual tool for what it's supposed to be, has blatantly never read or looked at the people like, just turning it into a bit of a game. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the BPs and the shells of this world that are doing some things to make themselves green, but they're some, uh, they're rated as like some of the greenest companies in the world, which yeah. they are blatantly not. So mm. ESG is, is a start and anybody basing their whole investing thesis on it has just not read the rules. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, pretty unbelievable. Um, any other, are there any other CEOs out there that we can think of that are doing a worse job than Larry think? Steve sent me to go and look at uh, or think of CEOs that I thought might be under pressure in their jobs. I'm, I'm always a little bit uneasy on this kind of thing, right? In that, I, I just like the idea of calling for anyone's job here. It, I wouldn't like someone to start calling for mine particularly, so I'm wary about doing it for them. Um, but in terms of people who I thought might likely be in trouble, whether or not I thought they ought to be, two came to mind. Um, the first was a guy called Amadeo Felisa. Um, don't know if either of you know who he's the CEO of. Um, no. Nope. Uh, he's in charge at Aston Martin, and the main reason I think his job might be under danger is they appear to have installed a revolving door around the kind of CEO's mm. office uh, <laughs> there. So not that he's done anything at all or I've paid any attention to what he's done in the last sort of five minutes while he's been in charge of the company, but if I was going to just randomly bet based on the kind of previous statistical evidence of who might be leaving sometime soon, Aston Martin seems like a sensible place to look. But I actually chose Chris Hill. Uh, as my CEO that I thought might be in some form of danger. Not the one on our show. Uh, That (laughs) one's great, and I'm not sure he's the CEO of anything. But um, Chris Hill in this context, uh, or in this kind of manifestation, is the CEO at Hargreaves Lansdowne. Uh, And he's been there since 2017. Um, Their share price was about £16. Then it's now down to £8.36. So that share price has gone down by around 48%. Revenue has grown by about 8% on average, but it's slipped back by about the same amount in the last year. Operating income since 2017 is up by just under 1%. EPS was 45p a share in 2017. Steve, any idea what it is now? Not that. (laughs) No, it's not that. You're close, though. Go on. It's 46p a share. Uh, Now... Um, and more generally, things appear to be going in the wrong direction for Hargreaves, and I think this is quite a difficult ship to turn around here. So when you think about their competition, it's mainly free brokerages, and it's quite hard for them to, I think, switch and pivot their business because their main kind of revenue comes from effectively just pinging customers for a little bit of their uh, account each time, and they generally don't mind. They tend to stick around for quite a long time, and you charge them gradually as you go along, and historically that's worked quite well. But it isn't at the moment, and the natural way for it to try and transition its business would be to something like a Charles Schwab model, where you make money on the cash held in people's accounts like a bank would. Mm. But that needs quite a lot of cash to do, and it's not an easy switch. And I think it's based on what Damien was telling us, actually, a few weeks ago uh, on the show about Hargreaves Lansdowne and what he knows about that company. It looks like quite a hard thing to sort of move from here. So that's uh, a CEO who I would be, I suppose, a bit fearful for based on 
track record of share price, the underlying business, and it looks like they're in a little bit of a state at the moment. It feels a bit Bob Swan at Intel to me. It looks like, I mean, you could use the same argument at the moment. The revenue is down because of the the outflows of investors at the moment, but um, it's, <laughs> it is a little bit more than that, isn't it? It's very much more than that. The Hargreaves Lansdowne business model appears to be based on the idea that because older, richer people have had money in there for so long, they're going to keep it in there. And ultimately, they're going to, the, the, the way it, it's barely even called sticky. Well, it's not stickiness because I don't think it has. It isn't a particularly sticky product. It's quite easy to switch to another investment account these days. But it's 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 the lack of education dare i say or, or just keeping their cust- customers in this one box where it doesn't they, they just don't seem to know any different elsewhere but once they do and once they gradually wake up to the lower commission uh, options like vanguard and, and charles swab like you say um there's going to be more opening up and you would have thought a good ceo who's on top of it would create more than just a crap app to try and keep people there it's it's worse than that though, isn't it? Because they they they're basically trading on this notion of strength. Um, we've been here a long time. Look at us; we're really strong. We're in the FTSE one hundred and occasionally FTSE two hundred and fifty. Um, <laughs> we you know we're we're doing we're doing really well. We have the biggest assets under management. By the by, the way. look at this rich uh, conservative donor um, chairman we have. But the problem is, is that when you're as front uh, as forefront as that, the minute you start losing money, everybody's going to know about it, and that. That uh, that that strength that you market yourself on disappears rather rapidly. Now, I think Hargreave should be straight onto free trade and buying free trade because I think that gives them at least the very basic technology that they can build a new platform on. Because from my understanding, um, Hargreaves Lansdowne's technology is a mishmash of systems that's all sort of like sellotaped together. And that's why their charges are so high is because they can't physically reduce them because the technology is so old and rubbish and the connections are so bad that, you know, it, it literally costs them a certain amount to, to, to deal. So that's what I would be doing. I would be buying free trade, sending it private, maybe sticking a, a lower fee on it and but but using it as a technological basis to rebuild the Hargreaves platform on at the moment they seem to be doing nothing and that steve does make that seat get a little bit hotter for me too it's the um it's the talent they've got to attract to bring all that together so it's... you get them with free trade <laughs> <laughs> Because I well, can't see your face, you can, I don't know the level of sarcasm that you've got coming. You can out sack the management. <laughs> you can sack the management. You get the engineers who, yeah, you know, they may be talented people. They're obviously lacking direction at free trade. They're capable people. Yeah, no, good, very, very good point. There, there's somebody in there that's making a, uh, a really reasonable product, isn't there? And and I, I, yeah, but he's still going to need. He's still going to need a, a management team that's going to be able to put that all together. And and so far, mm. like you say, they're they're not they're not far sighted enough to figure out <laughs> that they they need to modernise, um, or at least they don't, or, or at least maybe this is their version of modernisation, and and, and mm. that's just how they want to do. It. Because you got to remember, there is an element in the UK here of uh, class and. Mm. Um, elitism. Let's talk about it. yeah, basically elitism, which um, is basically is what Hargreaves Lansdowne kind of runs off. It's the, the players brand, on you. The brand is is that safety elitism, blah blah blah. Better where, than thou. Yeah. Yes. I I personally feel like that's what it is. Right. It, it's it's like mm. the it's the um, it's it's the financial equivalent of having a Land Rover, I guess, versus you know the adverts that came out of Trading Two One Two, which were the people drinking gold and throwing money into fireplaces and things <laughs> like that. Um, and 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 that was the that was the marketing that's being played here. And maybe it just maybe um, Hargreaves Lansdowne is that's that's worth playing, and that. And that's kind of winning at the moment. I certainly know a couple of people who still have their money in Hargreaves Lansdowne simply because their dads told them to keep it in there, which is quite mm. interesting to, to think about. Um, I, 
Anyone got anything more to say on that one? I think we did that one pretty good. I've got I've got a different CEO that I think is potentially in the hot seat. Uh, and the results came out uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, mine is Graham Stapleton. He is the CEO of Halfords, and he's been there for about uh, just under five years, something like that. So quick question for you two. Um, Steve, I'll let you go first. What are the sort mm-hmm. of top couple of qualities that you want from your CEOs? I think I want two things, Steve, and I'm probably not sure my list expen- extends much past two, to be honest. Number one, I want some sort of vision for where the company's going to go. And number two, I want the ability to communicate that vision to me in terms that I can understand. And that way I can figure out whether or not we're on the same page. And if we are, then we can, you know, I can go forward as an investor with the company. And if I'm not, well, then we can part ways and I'll look somewhere else. Paul? Uh, they, they are very, very good points. And they're the two I would have gone to first. So to be different... I'm going to say uh, good capital allocation. Pays a dividend. Yes, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say good capital allocation and to be well thought of by their employees. Yeah, I, I, mm-hmm. see, look, I'd agree with them. I'd trust where the, that, that he's obviously a leader. Maybe he's a visionary. He's a long-term thinker. He's got a sound grasp of the financials. I think they're all kind of things that I would, you know, uh, that I that I'd want in my CEO. So let's let's just quickly check if you think Graham Stapleton has got them. So Halfords, for those who don't know, I guess we will have people who watch this who aren't in the UK. It's a motoring and cycling company, and it has uh, retail centres and auto centres dotted all over the UK. It's where Casper, who helps us out with our editing on our highlights channel, goes to check out his new in-car sound system and to buy <laughs> LED strip lighting for his footwell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the revenue is up about 10.2% this year uh, on a light for light basis, which is about 13% over the last three years uh, in, in my maths. Net income came in at 11.5 million. That's actually down 56% year on year. Uh, costs rose 46.8% and finance expenses rose by 7%. So over the last 10 years, Halfords has been sort of rapidly disposing of its real estate. And leasing it back on long-term leases. So you'd expect it to have a pretty decent balance sheet. So on the last earnings call, the CEO told us that the tyre market is in a depression. Uh, you'd think that would be good for tyre shops, right? Um, but seriously, it's cost pressures. Inflation, he said. <laughs> Come on. I mean, these tyre shops are writing themselves, right? Um, and pay pressures, essentially. Um he reckons the Halford's digital experience was one of the main cost drivers. Uh, but don't worry, he said. They're going to put LED lighting into the stores, and that will save them around £10 million a year. That's what he says. Ooh, uh, you know what? It's getting quite bad when you give me some of the cost-saving uh, some of the cost saving things that the CEO is coming out is changing the light bulbs. <laughs> yeah, yes. They, well, here getting... we go. So... <laughs> He did finish it by increasing the dividend poll, so you will like him. Uh, and he also <laughs> reduced the guidance. Uh, so look, I hear you. Look, revenue's up. But I can tell you all of this is from acquisitions because Halfords have been buying every little family auto centre up and down the country in an attempt to force through growth. So there can't be any long-term goals here. So Halfords auto centres cover basic petrol and diesel car necessities. So we're talking about oil changes or an oil top-up or a spark plug or maybe a air filter. None of these things are in an electric car. So (laughs) what I think Halfords are doing here is essentially doubling down on a declining market. So they're literally trading like short-term market share for long-term market structural decline. So I pulled this thing out of the end. I I just had to laugh. Point number four, this is in their headline point. So they're giving you the eight key parts of, um, of Halfords. Number four, strong balance sheet and cash generative. The group has always maintained balance sheet and benefits from a cash generative business model with good free cash flow, enabling investment in our plans. Free cash flow, minus (laughs) (laughs) 14.9 million. (laughs) So looking through Halford's balance sheet, they've got about 23 million in in net cash, sorry, if you ignore leases. About 180 million left in the revolving credit facility should they need it. They're going to need it. Let's not lie to each other. But this plan just seems to me like Graham said, let's go bust over a long period of time. Because if that isn't the plan, then, well, what is the plan? Perhaps they, I don't know. I was thinking that to that yourself. First of all, I was thinking to myself, oh, it's a bit of a shame because Halfords 
has a lot going for it in in theory in my head you know i think there's stickiness in the brand there i think um and also i would say i've been going to halfords for my mot recently simply for the ease of it so i simply am able to go on the halfords website and find a place to book my mot rather than having to personally make contact with a fucking engineer or, or or a mechanic and have to negotiate a price of some sort and hope that that guy isn't screwing me over on my mot or, or you know some of the other things that, that I, I it's a shame at first because i think there's something there but um what you know everybody at present needs an MOT so why is it not making money and um, why is it why are they not able to even though they're at scale why are they not able to bring down prices to similar levels to local mechanics I, I don't get it it doesn't seem to make sense to me they, they probably are the issue is is that this is a, already a highly commoditized industry if in, even if halford so the vast majority of the auto centers in a, in an area then they're never going to be able to charge what they want they're, they're not going to be able to flex any kind of pricing power here because oil is oil it doesn't matter where you get it from it's just the same thing that goes into your engine the same way that spark plugs are spark plugs you, you mm. can only usually get a couple of sets for an engine and whether halford supply it or whether you know bob's auto center supply it, they're the same thing that all the things that they offer are very highly commoditized business so one why you would want to push yourself into that business and and make a lot of acquisitions is is uh, mm-hmm. somewhat troubling two why you would be paying a dividend when you've got so little cash available and you're not actually generating any free cash flow and yeah. you're being highly acquisitive that's probably not a good thing as well but i mean this just lacks the vision of like you see these retail businesses and they completely turn themselves around and like best buy did when 10 years ago nobody would have thought best buy would have would have been available you know would have yeah, still been true. about but best buy decided to differentiate itself and focus on the things that made it different and sell that as a benefit to the customer and, and that that was now we realize a really visionary way of looking at things halford's here just seemed to be like well we do cars and bikes so let's just continue <laughs> doing things that cars have and you know perhaps we should maybe do some more things that bikes have and oh (laughs) cars need tires so we'll buy tire centers and you just think like wow you just have a stunning lack of vision and and to me that just means like i mean is halford's going to be here in 10 years i just can't see it what do you think what do you think they should do because i think they've they've gone online that's been a big move for them and they are running currently running the Halfords Club, I believe, where they send you emails every day to try and get you to sign up for their club and get 10% off all their deals at Halfords Club, which, yeah, doesn't seem that imaginative either. I, I, I don't know what the answer is, though, because Halfords brand is is there to, there to have. And I think mm-hmm. I would have thought they could pass on the costs to... Like, I don't you know, know how I would... Head fix yeah. this if i were the halford ceo but when steve was describing the business to me one thing i immediately didn't like was selling your real estate and then leasing it back again. yeah that, was uh, that crazy. bothered me yeah. quite a bit mostly yeah. because i sort of thought here's how i would prefer this business and i don't know how it gets there for what it's worth i would much prefer this business if it was a franchising business if it basically mm. um sat there and used what you describe as the halford's branding uh, stuff because it's recognizable and i suspect that i I personally do trust Halfords a bit more than I trust random local mechanic person uh, to not take advantage of me in terms of knowing what my car does or doesn't need. Uh, probably for the wrong reasons for what it's worth. They, uh, Halfords put together my bike, and it's a decent bike. It was poorly assembled. But um, I kind of think on this situation... It's the business model that I don't like here very much. I dislike the idea of leasing back your own real estate. It sounds expensive to me. Uh, yeah, it, like you say, you know, you are looking here at taking on the McDonald's model of um, roughly that, yeah, yeah, the, the McDonald's model of of car parts, I guess, and and I, I was mm. I would say to you as well, like Steve mentioned earlier, the the future of a car right now does seem ambiguous at best. We don't we don't know where our MOTs are going to come from, you know, if, certainly if you take a Tesla right now, it has to go back to Tesla. Our other company is going to sort of run that as a sort of, um, uh, you know, self-contained model from, from now on. Like, you know, you only have to, you can only come back to 
uh, the car manufacturer to get your car MOT because uh, uh, electric motors and electric systems are, are far too complicated for the average mechanic now nowadays. I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is there, and uh, it's yeah, you know I can't see can't see how it is as far as bikes go. I can't really think of another place to go to 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 buy a bike from. Um, if if I went to a cycle shop in my local area. I know I would be charged through the nose for any bike that they've got. Like it's it's so much more expensive than one of those cycle shops, and I personally don't have the money to pay that sort of level for a bike. But in Halfords, I seem to be able to get a good deal every now and then, or at least a if you want deal. a recommendation there, Paul, I would say go to Decathlon. They tend to have kind Ooh, of uh, yeah, slightly above actually, average right. bikes yeah. at slightly below average prices. But I guess that yeah. wasn't really where we were meant to be uh, going. No. Steve, what do you think there? It was only that I just think if, if we're going back to the lack of invention, then the, the leasing, selling, selling your properties and leasing back to you just adds extra strain on the balance sheet, mm-hmm. especially if the only thing you're doing with that money is buying tire shops and dividending it out. Yeah. It doesn't unless make it any a, it does. Yeah, unless it was a desperate move to make, to, to, to acquire <clears throat> something good. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's silly, isn't it? Yeah, and that's it, though. That just leaves you in a worse position, doesn't it? So my issue here is that they're almost being populist in that they're hanging on to this dividend because they know it's holding up the share price, which coincidentally is about 45% uh, down since <laughs> Graham um, took over. Um, but th- there's nothing here to inspire. Like As an investor, you look at a company and you think, okay, right, this company is in dire straits. I can see in 10 years' time this company won't be here. What is it doing to turn, in its, turn itself around? Right, okay, so it's investing into a market that we know is in structural decline. We don't know the rate in which it will decline, but we know that generally it's in structural decline. The other problem is is that a lot of um, a lot of people who buy petrol and diesel cars at the moment tend to do it on PCP in the UK and they tend to come with some kind of um, servicing deal or they come with some kind of maintenance deal if you pay for that. This is about £40 a month, which I'd argue is probably worth it if you get your tyres in. Um, so this is another customer that unless Halfords can tie up that with that specific PCP provider, they won't go to Halfords because you can only go to a certain place uh, mm-hmm. to have your to have your car fixed. So th- this just to me just feels like all sorts of wrong. It just feels like yeah. they're, they're basically selling off the real estate. They're using that to pay off a dividend, which I guess is marginally better than using debt to pay off a dividend in this kind of area. But they're, they're running out of cash. They've got this 180 million debt facility, which just sounds expensive to me. Um, the companies are worth about 400 million at the moment. I just don't think this is a company that that is going to exist. I just don't see the vision. Yeah, um, and fi- it just seems like financially that is a, an absolute waste of time. I, I did have the idea that this becoming an MOT network or a mechanic network seemed like a really interesting idea, but still, does, where's the money in it? You know, you you simply got to add a premium on top on top of that. Well, and, if you're talking about well, commoditized, the MOT yeah. is probably the most commoditized product in the market. Yeah, isn't exactly. It? I, I'm just using it as as the example. Okay, but mm. um, yeah, so that's Halfords then. Um, dying stock and uh, one I guess that Steve T is uh, looking to avoid. Unfortunately, um, we've run over a bit too far this week, so we're gonna have to miss out on Netflix this week. But we're, I'm well informed that that is a really good piece that we're going to save for next week. Uh, thanks, guys, for listening this week, um, and we'll see you next week.